So tonight's program on grief and, grief and loss and addiction and recovery will be, be presented by Jerry Fouché and Barb Smith. Jerry Fouché has extensive experience in the field of education as an administrator, facilitator, strategist, teacher, and practitioner in the areas of educational administration, curriculum, instruction, and staff development, and has played leadership roles in many initiatives in various public school districts. After several years as a Dawn Farm Sparrow Recovery Counselor and later as an outpatient therapist, Jerry Fouché cur currently serves as a personal medicine therapist and a didactic group facilitator for Dawn Farm. Jerry was instrumental in the implementation of Dawn Farm's didactical, dialectical behavior therapy and personal medicine programs. Barb Smith is the author of Brent's World about the life and death of her oldest son and a public speaker at, the, at, community, at community, school, and church functions. Please join me in welcoming our presenters, Jerry and Barb. Thank you, Brad, and, and, and thank you, folks. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be with you tonight. I also want to express my gratitude to Janice Fern, this person who's done a lot of work in this area and from whose uh, efforts I have benefited significantly tonight. Um, grief and loss, as they mentioned, can be heavy topics. You know, and as we work our way through this, we may touch some of the personal losses for you. It may cause you to feel, about, feel or think about them in a new or different way. Um, grief work can be challenging. It can be exhausting. But when we're done here tonight, my hope is that, that you, will, you, will, you will seek help, that you'll be good to yourself. Uh, if you're feeling things, that you're connecting with a friend or sponsor, somebody you can discuss what's going on with you. Embrace the feelings and move forward. If there were, if there were a single message I would try to convey as we talk about the processing of grief tonight, it's, it's about feel the feelings and do it anyway. It's about embrace it and move forward. As we start to think about the topic tonight, we want to look at this. There's a few key questions we want to explore and discuss in the course of our time together tonight. And it looks kind of like this. Like number one is like, why do we want to bother talking about grief? And it, because it's, it becomes the elephant in the room if we don't talk about it. Uh, why do we experience grief? And then there's some real specific information behind that I think becomes illustrative as you start to think about your experiences. What are some of the theories about grief? There are a number of them. Uh, what we know is, is that they provide us handles for thought about it, but do not give us a, a, a clear timeline or a clear uh, sort of instruction manual for how to handle it. Uh, how is grief related to addiction? And this is a piece that is, has that is not perhaps gotten as much attention as it should. Because we want to talk about it from the perspective of what grief does addiction produce? What happens to the addict or alcoholic who has had a loss and consequently has challenges experiencing the grief? And we want to talk about the grief of those surrounding the addict and alcoholic. But how is grief also experienced in recovery? Because what we know is that it is, that it is, it is a, sort of a big, one of the tasks of recovery is grieving those things which have been lost in the course of our time of addiction. You know, and what helps make a difference. So that's, that's basically the topic we want to cover tonight. Um, and there are some key concepts that we start thinking about grief and loss. I mean, the first thing is grief is real. It can't be ignored. If somebody says, no, I'm cool, and I'm not bothered by whatever it is, and I've had a loss where we're not hearing an accurate portrayal, grief is kind of like the, the, the song they teach you at summer camp. It's so high you can't get over it. It's so low you can't get under it. It's so wide you can't get around it. The only thing you do with grief is go right through it. Now, lots of us dance around it. Some of us drink and drug it away for a while. But the bottom line is a real piece in order to effectively live in life. I need to walk through it. Now you may be able to say, no, Jerry, I'm above that. But as we proceed tonight, my hope is we're going we're to see a, a deeper understanding of why that's true. We know that the expressions are many and varied. Different persons in different roles, they cry, they get angry, they're depressed, they're withdrawn, they act out, they laugh, exhibit a very broad range of emotional expressions and behaviors. You know, there, there are stages and models, as we mentioned, but they're not linear. And for instance, you'll see Kubler-Ross talks about five stages, one, two, three, four, five, and one may think that, oh, they happen in that order. Well, I'm not done with this one yet. Can I be done with that one by the weekend? And it doesn't quite work like that. Um, talk about working through emotions requires a willingness to acknowledge the loss and change. Uh, we just have to be willing to embrace it, to face the reality that is in front of us. And it takes time to work through grief. It isn't, isn't the kind of thing that's going to happen quickly. And last but not least, active alcoholism and addiction significantly complicate the process of grief as we walk through that. 
So to answer that first question, why do we talk about it? It's because change happens. Now you might not automatically associate the word change with, with grief. But what we know is that any change in your life usually involves some kind of loss. For instance, Janice provided me with one of the best examples of this. She talked about that recently she got married. She got married to this person she's madly in love with and very happy to be with him. But she was 36 years old when she got married. And she said, part of what I had to lose was some of my singleness. I had my own place with my own stuff on my own and nobody meddled with it. And I had to start to deal with the fact that things were going to be different now. I had to adjust or change to the process. So even though it wasn't a, it wasn't a real tearjerker of a grief, it was a real piece of grief based on that loss. That most changes involve some kind of loss. Uh, to experience life is, is to have losses in various kinds. Somebody, one of the authors refers to the many little deaths we have from time to time of the things that we lose. And acknowledging each and every one of them is, is the healthiest way to approach it. Uh, change is inevitable. Growth is optional. Our friend Walt Disney shared that piece with us. No, but we want to understand that we experience grief because of our attachments. And this is perhaps the most, the most key piece to understand in the course of our time tonight is that attachment theory really describes the dynamics of any long-term relationship. It has to do with the, the, the deep and enduring bond that exists between people. In addition to other people, you can also be attached to things, animals, pets, jobs, roles, rituals, or objects. And you say, well, what is, how does this attachment thing work? Well, ordinarily, as we start to think about people, we think of them forming what I would call a secure attachment. In other words, if I can depend on other people in my relationships, they can depend on me. When they say they're going to show up, they show up. I, I, I know that I'm always going to get treated honestly and fairly. We call that a secure relationship. This is a very profound thing. And if we lose one of these, we're really having a very large loss. But we find there are also some folks who form or are involved in what we would call an anxious attachment. In other words, well, this is a person I love, I care about a great deal, but you know, you can't always depend on them. They might not always show up. The expectations are not always clear. And so I've got to be a little on edge. And sometimes I find myself angry or irritated or frustrated with the fact that that person won't respond in a way that is, that is useful. And last but not least, we have what is called an avoidant attachment. And that's when I'm thoroughly attached to someone for some good reason, perhaps a significant relationship, a parent, a child, a spouse. But there's something very unhealthy in the relationship. It might be abuse, it might be whatever. And so I'm attached to this, this person, this entity, even though it's not a fun experience. And, and, and even though I, I think to avoid it, I'm still deeply attached. Now what's, what's important to understand about all those attachments is that not all attachments are reciprocal. By that I mean I can be attached to somebody else and they may not be attached back. And that's kind of when we realize that sometimes. You realize, oh, this relationship isn't equal. And there's something not unbalanced about it. And you may want to reevaluate, do you want to continue to maintain that relationship when you understand that? Unless, of course, there's some, some reason that you, you made that decision. I guess that's the other piece about, about attachments that's important to understand is that at some point, whether it was conscious or not, I made a clear decision to attach myself to that person, to that pet, to that job role, uh, to that, um, that art piece of artwork, whatever it is that I've, I've grown attached to. Um, but the other thing is people will grieve anything that they've ever been attached to regardless of the type of attachment. So even if I have an avoidant attachment to an abusive spouse because we have kids together and I really want and I keep trying to make things work even though I know it's never worked over and over and over and over again. If something happens to that person, I will still grieve that loss because of the attachment that I have made. And some folks have to really sort of sit back and scratch their heads on that one a little bit. But the bottom line is you may wonder, why do I miss that person? They were nasty. I'm glad they're gone. It's like, yeah, perhaps. But the bottom line is you were attached. You made a decision. There was some meaning in that relationship for you. And to acknowledge that is important. Otherwise, I'm denying the reality of the grief I face. And the challenge of that is that if I do not accept the reality of the grief that I face, it starts to become very difficult for me to form new attachments. Because that's all about the processing of grief is about learning to let things go and about learning to embrace new attachments, to form new ones. I mean, people have all kinds of attachments. I mean, I just got a great long list here, and I, I won't belabor going through it all. But these are all places where human beings are attached. We're attached in so many places, and so consequently our losses are many because we're attached to so many different things. We think of suffering as its source in challenges that threaten the intactness of the person as a complex social and psychological entity. 
The multiple facets of a person's many roles in life and their many attachments are all places where change and consequently loss can happen. All losses need to be grieved in some form or another. I'm thinking too about the, the, the uniqueness of people's response to grief or loss. Now there's some broad similarities for sure, but you have to understand that everybody's approach to it, or, or several people's approach to the same loss, may be dramatically different. Their perception is key. How do I, how do I perceive this attachment in terms of its importance in my life? You know, uh, my response is going to be individual. And, and the other thing that's important to realize is ha have I had several challenges or losses recently? Uh, for instance, if you look at the second half of the handout package, you'll see this thing called a life event scale. And what it does is give you several events that can happen in life, some good, some not so good. But it has a numerical scale for each one of them. And basically what it says is you can kind of figure out how many happened in the last year, add it all up, and sort of get a numerical indicator of your potential for not feeling well, for being out of it, for not handling things well. Okay? And again, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a mathematical uh, uh, perfectly model. We can't guarantee it's always going to give you complete. But sometimes people are startled when they sit that and think about, well, what are all the things that have happened within the last year? You go, wow, a lot has happened. What I know is particularly for people in recovery, they usually way underestimate the amount of stuff that has happened in their life. You've got to remember, all those changes mean some kind of loss. All those losses mean some need for grief. As we think about it. As you think about the responses to grief that are, that are fairly typical. I mean, we're biopsychological, social, spiritual pre creatures. You know, so we're going to have emotional responses like being sad, being angry, in shock, relieved, or I just simply don't know where I am with it emotionally. I mean, physical people record feeling hot, tired, cold, tense, being hungry, or having no appetite at all. Mentally or cognitively, you know, people have a sense of yearning or longing. They seem consumed by thoughts of death. Or they may, in fact, be thinking that the loss is still present. I remember in great detail several years ago, my wife's uncle passed. And we went to the visitation. And when we got to the visitation, her uncle was saying, they're telling us the story about the day she, his wife had died. And she died very suddenly and unexpectedly. And so they had the coroner come out, and they'd taken the body to the funeral home. And he'd gone to the funeral home, made all the arrangements. And then he came home, and as he's walking in from the garage, he's looking for his wife to tell him, to report out with the things he had just done. Because that's what he always did when he got home. He reported out. And he suddenly realized, she's not here to report to. It was just that little, that little mental piece of not quite connecting fully with the, with the reality of what was taking place just yet. Those kind of things can happen. You know, we need to give space to people to let them happen. We talk about behaviorally. Or socially, people cry, they sleep, they want to be alone, they want to be with others, they, they can't stand to be alone. I mean, spiritually is sometimes some of the biggest challenges for people in this response because some people, they need to find meaning. Most people need to find some meaning. But they'll be asking questions like, why? Like, where is God in all this? They seek support in their faith community, or sometimes they get good and mad at God, you know? And it's like, this isn't the way it's supposed to happen. We, we did our part. We were right. We were good people. Why is this vestige upon me? And again, I'm, I'm not rendering any, any judgments on rightness or wrongness. It's just that it is there, and, and just understand it as part of it. Some people confuse grief with depression. Now, there's a little bit of an interesting image, but grief can feel like a roller coaster. And you go, what do you mean, Jerry? But no, it's very much an up and down experience. So let me give you the, the crisp, most crystal example I can think of. A situation where grandma's dying, and the family's kind of gathered around the bed. And people are talking about like, oh, how wonderful she was, and oh, she was so good to us, and she always had us over for the holidays. And people are crying and, and really sharing their, their grief and their sadness at a deep level. And somebody will say, yeah, but remember last Christmas? Grandma burned the carrots, smoked up the whole house. We had to call the fire department. People start laughing because they're exploring the richness of what life with grandma was like. And again, grief is about exploring the richness of what was lost. It can be a very powerful experience. So we talk about grief being like that roller coaster up and down. Depression is, in fact, more like, more like a dead end. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's an experience that, that may, may not have any specific event that triggered it. It's, limit, it's limited positive hope for the future. It's flattened emotions and sometimes even self-loathing. But a person can be experiencing both grief and depression at the same time. 
And sometimes this combination requires some professional support. But you want to distinguish the two. I'm, I'm down and I'm in grief. Or depression is, no, I'm just down. And I'm here for a good long time. And nothing I seem to do <coughs> seems to change or manage it for me. There's some myths about, about grief that I, I want to put out there. By the way, I, I, sort of, I, I often reference deaths as the loss. But recall that long list of things people could lose. I lost the job. Uh, I lost a limb and I'm now handicapped. I, lost, I want you to think about loss in a very broad sense because they all require grief of some kind to fully process, to get back to forming new attachments. And that, that's, that's the piece I want to make sure we all walk out with tonight. You know, th sometimes people will say things like, well, the pain of loss will go away faster if you just ignore it. Just, just go to work and just get things done and just, just, just ignore it for a while. Once again, I remind you of the camp song. It's so high you can't get over it. It's so low you can't get You got to go through it. That doesn't mean you have to live it nonstop, 24 hours a day, until you feel completely different. Matter of fact, that's probably not a healthy way to handle it. Probably you do want to get out and do some stuff. But compelling yourself to go back to work full time after a significant loss, that might not be the healthiest thing to do. I mean, you cut yourself some more slack than that. Some people talk about, well, it's important to be strong in the face of loss. No, it's important to be real in the face of loss. Um, real about the emotions. Walk through them. You know, we need to teach kids how to grieve, too. If, if I'm having a very strong emotional reaction, let's talk about death for a moment. I'm having a very strong emotional reaction to a death. I may want to dampen that down a little bit for the two-year-old, because the two-year-old may just be like, what's going on? You know, this, this strong expression of grief may be too much. But I do need to spend some time ex explaining death to them to whatever degree is appropriate. I remember very distinctly, I was five years old, and I believe my sister, who is here tonight? My sister. I uh, was probably seven at the time. And my dad took us to my great uncle's funeral. Now this was a person I'd never met. But the purpose of this trip was not for us to go grieve my great uncle, who was somebody we maybe saw at a wedding once or something, you know, and we were kids. The purpose of this event was to teach us about death and about funerals. So he would this is the casket. So he said, you know, I had silly questions like, well, does he have a suit on underneath that bottom part? You know, and you know, it's like, that's the stuff kids wonder about, you know? And um, you know, he explained all that stuff so that every time after that when I encountered a death or a funeral, I remember a classmate died when I was in third grade a few years later, okay? I knew what was going to happen. There was no mystery to it. I still had my own personal grief, but I had the process. But what's interesting is to know the motivation for my father doing that was that my mother insisted that he do it. And the reason she insisted that he do it was that my mother had never been to a funeral or never seen a dead body until she was 16 years old. And she had been so sheltered from it it was too much of a shock for her. So she said, no, take Susan Jerry, go, go, you know? So it's, it's interesting because if you, I, I think of the, the French philosopher Rousseau wrote a book on education entitled Emile, and he said, you know, if we shield children from pain, we don't teach them to bear it, we train them to feel it. And I thought he was incredibly powerful there because sometimes people, oh, no, keep the kids away from the grief. Wait, wait, they don't need to know about that. It's like, no, they do need to know at whatever degree is appropriate. Every degree is noticeable. People say, well, if you don't cry, it means I'm not really sorry about the loss. No, nah, not necessarily. Um, sometimes people are just too tired to cry, or they say things like, I don't have any tears left. Um, it's, crying is not the only, nor necessarily the best way to grieve. It is a way. And I just need to realize that the emotional expressions are going to take lots of different forms. And the people say things like, well, grief lasts about a year. You sort of have to get through all the birthdays and the holidays and those kinds of things. And then once you get past that, you'll be OK. No, I, th I think I want to tell you that grief just lasts. It changes. It evolves over time. It becomes less intense. It will spike at anniversaries. I'll tell you a story about one particular woman. Um, every year for years, her husband had taken care of the taxes. And he died suddenly and unexpectedly. And suddenly it came around to be April 15th, and she realized she didn't have a clue what to do. And so she panicked. And of course, she had to start making phone calls around her. But suddenly, the, the, the loss of her husband was so big in front of her again because of this one encounter, this unexpected encounter with this piece she hadn't even thought about until suddenly it was due. It's how grief can sort of sneak up on you sometimes because you suddenly bump into a place that, that you didn't expect it. Um, and that's an interesting story. I'll come back to the taxes a little, little bit later. Um, but uh, Janice created a very interesting thing. You know, it's, if we're attached, we stay attached. And you say, well, does that mean I have to be walking around in grief all the time? Now, if you think about it, 
Janice says, I'd like you to think about your life as if it's a tapestry. Okay, I start up here and I start weaving. And I, and I put in the various colors and the times. And there are some parts that are bright, some parts that are dark. But let's say, for instance, I have a major loss. And so I weave in this, this strong purple band of color. And it's really a big piece. And it's very noticeable. And it stands out a lot. And it affects me a bunch every time I look at the tapestry. But the fact of the matter is, my life goes on. And I keep weaving the tapestry. And over time, that purple band becomes less noticeable because there's so much more of my life after it. It's set in context. Healthy grieving will place things in context over time. And I, I just love that image that, that, sh that she gave us. Um, to talk about the, the stages of grief, I mentioned Kubler-Ross before. She kind of did a lot of the original work oh, 50 or 60 years ago, a long time. But she talked about these five stages. And I want to sort of stretch those out a little bit. I mean, the first one is the, the shock or the denial. This just can't be happening. It wasn't exactly my wife's uncle's response, but it re really was. He just couldn't take it in as fact until he got home and realized she was not there to report out to. Um, but it's a failure to acknowledge the facts. There's a disbelief in the face of overwhelming ev evidence. And sometimes there's a compulsion to isolate, to get very separate. You should look at that second stage of anger. You know, it's, it's like, I can't be true. Somebody must be lying. You know, why is this happening? Who's to blame? What should have been done? I mean, we, we've got to, we're just mad as hell. You know? But the anger will get us nothing, it, it, other than the expression of the emotion. That we're saying. As you look at that third piece, bargaining, you know, well, I can make this happen if I, reach, if I make some heroic effort, certainly I can reverse this problem somehow. People start trying to bargain with God around various things. Um, the depression frequently sits there. It is very sad. But the sense of great loss, the reduction of self-image sometimes, like how am I diminished by this loss in some way? The realization, I remember a dear friend of mine lost her husband within the last year. And not long ago, she commented to me very sad suddenly that I just realized I'm never going to be anybody's wife again. <laughs> uh, she may get married again. I mean, she is in her 80s. But, uh, but, but, but the point is that for her, she was acknowledged, somehow she had been diminished by the loss of her husband, not just in a grief way, but she had been made less because that relationship was no longer whole. Um, the acceptance piece, you know, the inevitable will or has come, and no matter what is done, it must be faced. You know, it's like, I can exist with what has happened. I don't know what will follow, but I will do my best. That is the acceptance piece, whatever it is. I, 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 I lost this job, I'm handicapped, I'm whatever it is, I'm going to do it. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to give up the fighting. And they talk about the difference between suffering and, and just sort of getting by in life is this whole notion of acceptance. Because if you've got something going on that's hard to take in and you keep fighting it, you're going to be suffering. But if I accept it, you know, then I start learning how to operate the wheelchair. I start learning how to make things different. And it can be very powerful. The second author I want to reference quickly is uh, the Strobe and Schutz did this piece. And they talked about grief in a very different way. They talked about it in terms of, of uh, oscillating between loss-oriented and restoration-oriented. The other way I think about this is people that are emotional processors versus instrumental processors. OK, let me give you the example. So there's, a, there's an unexpected death in the family. And what happens is some people, it's like they need to sit down and cry. They need to talk about the crying. They need to express the feelings. They are unable to do anything. They can't even eat or sleep or do anything other than to have the feelings by whatever method they express that. The instrumental folks, on the other hand, are saying, oh, I have a dozen people I need to call. and I need to make some arrangements. I need to get this worked out. And how can I take care of that? And, and they're both processing the grief, but they're processing it very differently. Now, the trouble is, sometimes these two look at each other. Why aren't you sad? Can't you see all the work I'm doing? I mean, it's, it's just, but you have to understand, it's, it's just a different approach to processing it. The, the, uh, the other thing that, um, that Strobe and Schutt did about this dual processing model is finding a balance between the focus on feelings and the focus on the practical tasks. Um, people move back and forth between them. This model identifies two poles in the grieving process. They added a little piece that I really like, too. It says, where the individual sometimes confronts and at other times avoids these two tasks of grieving. In other words, you get to the place of, I'm tired of being instrumental and making plans, and I'm tired of grieving. Just leave me alone for a while. I want a vacation from it. And it may only be a 10-minute vacation, but I need that 10-minute vacation. 
and how do I allow people to get there? Um, the model argues that for what is called a dosage of griefing, that's their words, uh, this, that is the need to take a respite from dealing with either of these stressing tasks as an integral part of adapting, of adapting and adapting. Last but not least in this theory process, hit the right button, uh, is Warden talks about the four tasks of morning. So he, he sort of avoided the, the, the stages or the levels. Just trying to say, this four things you got to do. He didn't want to make it sound like it had to happen in any particular order. And he said, well, you may be like in two of them at the same time, or you may kind of spend time here and then go somebody else, someplace else later. He was sort of very flexible in that. And what I find is people who are actively working their grief do tend to bounce around quite a bit. You know, he uh, talks about these four tasks. Uh, you can see them on the screen. Um, they're an essential part of the healing process. After a loss, it takes time to return to an emotional state of well-being. But the tasks of working happen in no specific order. But you have to work through them if you're going to be effective and be able to form new attachments. If we break that first one around apart a little more, come full face to the fact that the loss is real and will not be reversed. An immediate reunion with it is impossible. As we start to think about the role of addiction plays in this, substance use significantly prevents someone from facing and accepting reality. That's just the most basic piece, number one. That, that should be no big surprise to a lot of people. But acceptance is often particularly difficult when the loss is a, the breakup of a romantic attachment. You have to think about this a minute. The attachment's been broken, but the former partner's still around. And people often entertain hopes that the breakup is not permanent, that, that and therefore acceptance is not needed or desired. It sounds like I find some people say they have a breakup and they can never seem to move on because they've stayed attached. They haven't grieved that loss and accepted it. They've stayed attached. <coughs> Um, you know, of course, the obstacles to accepting are denying the facts, denying the meaning. It wasn't, oh, yeah, some people will go through, well, it wasn't a, a good job anyway. I don't really miss it. You know, I don't really care about that. I'm just as healthy as I ever was. You know, or minimizing the loss. It was just no big deal. Um, and talk about, okay, let's, yeah, there we go. The second one talks about experiencing and working through the pain. It's impossible to lose something or someone you've been deeply attached to without experiencing some real level of pain. And substance abuse numbs the pain and prevents someone from working through it. Recovery can be a time of facing an incredible number of losses because they've all been stacked up and they're waiting for you. Because remember, you can't get over them or under it. You've got to go through it. You've got to go through it. Um, the recovering community can be a safe, provide a safe and supportive place for you to feel the feelings and work through the pain and the loss. It may seem an impossible task at first, but it can be done. But the obstacles to Experiencing and working through it is not allowing yourself to feel it, just drinking and drugging it away. Avoiding reminders. There's a, a wonderful example of, of talking about avoiding the reminders of the pain. There was a, a woman had, who, whose husband had died in the hospital in the town in which she lived. And after the funeral, she could not bring herself to drive by the hospital. She would go through great efforts to drive far around in order to avoid that process. Because being by there was enough of a reminder to provoke the grief again. And, and yet, by avoiding the grief, you know, she was only extending its, its life. It's unpleasant life. You know, the grief continues, but it isn't always going to be unpleasant. As so we look at number three, they talk about there's a new normal someplace in there. <coughs> Come to terms with it. Like, what are your external adjustments? How will the loss affect your everyday functioning in the world? You know, if it's a handicap now, what, what's it going to look like? How's it going to be different? If it's the loss of a person, the loss of a romantic relationship, the loss of a job, what's going to need to be different? Now, there are internal adjustments, like, how do I feel about me as a result of this? This is the third job I got fired from. How do I start to feel about me? What are my, what are, what are my level of confidence in moving towards something in the future? And you talk about spiritual adjustments, how these losses affect my beliefs, my values, my assumptions about the world. You know, this is life without the person or item. The loss is still important, but it's not preventing me from, from starting to form new attachments. And recovery helps us build new coping skills. Um, in fact, in recovery, it helps us see ourselves and the world quite differently. But the obstacles to getting to the new normal is promoting your own helplessness. Like, for instance, I talked about the lady before who suddenly realized on April 15th she had to do the taxes. She could have promoted her own helplessness by just letting it go and not doing anything, rather than finding somebody to help her do it, or getting online and finding out about Tax Act or whatever it is, that, you know, those, one of those software things. She could have done that. Uh, not developing the skills you need, withdrawing from the world, refusing to see yourself or the world differently. 
after the loss, the world is different. We need, we need to see it different. Last, in, in the Warden's four stages is to emotionally relocate, to find a place for what was lost that will enable us to remain connected, but a way that will not keep us from going on in life. That whole notion that, you know, they're gone but not forgotten. Fully processed grief doesn't mean that I've forgotten about the thing that it's lost. It means I've put it in a healthy place. I've gotten to the place where I'm, I'm that's, that's what it is. Um, as we start to think about that, you know, working through recovery allows us to be at peace with the past, to be vulnerable to life in a healthy way, to forgive and to ask for forgiveness, and to form new attachments. The psychologist Eric Fromm you know, suggests that to spare oneself from grief at all costs can be achieved only at the price of total detachment, which also excludes the ability to experience happiness. I want to tell you, folks who can never be happy are folks that got some stuff they need to grieve. They've got to sort it out. And of course, the obstacles are withdrawing, um, unwillingness to love and be healthy, be vulnerable, holding on so tight to the past that you're unable to form new relationships and develop new skills. So I want to talk very specifically about how addiction interferes with grief. Um, it's, there's a lot of stuff there. I mean, number one, we know there's a lot of unresolved grief, loss, and trauma that can frequently predate the use of alcohol. Many of our clients at the farm, as we start to they start to get sober, they start to unfold, but they, they write this thing called history of addiction, which basically is sort of like a life history. It focuses a lot on their use, but it frequently starts out when they were kids, and I lost this, and this happened, and this trauma happened, and this assault happened, and, and these are the pieces. Now, I want to be really, really clear that assault and trauma do not cause addiction. It may put it on fast forward, but, but addiction is a freestanding entity. And that, that's, I want to be careful with that, because sometimes folks have the notion that, well, once I sort out my trauma and stuff, I'm going to be okay and I can drink and drug safely. And it doesn't work like that. So I just want to be clear about that. But some, some folks have plenty to grieve before they even start using. Cl oh, pardon me. I'm bouncing through the wrong number here. Okay, there's a lack of healthy support systems. The biggest word that describes the social system of a late-stage alcoholic or addict is isolation. Even if people are around, I am alone. I don't let anybody inside to know what's going on. And again, that's going to get in the way of me processing grief because it's very difficult to process by myself. Of course, we can't process grief when we're drunk or high. Can't process much of anything. The losses tend to pile up already, and they've not been fully grieved. Yeah, addicts tend to minimize and normalize losses. By minimize, they will say things like, well, that sort of stuff happens to everybody. Everybody ODs now and then. Do I get ambulance ride? It's kind of an exciting thing, actually, you know? And I, I got funny stories I can tell. I can impress my other addict friends with. We tend to really minimize. Or what to me was sort of more startling was we tend to normalize behavior that is anything but normal. So for instance, in the exploration of a client was talking, a female client was talking about some of her sexual encounters that she was uncomfortable with. By the time she got done exploring this for a while, these weren't sexual encounters, these were sexual assaults. And her thought was, well, this kind of stuff just happens. No, it doesn't just happen. It shouldn't just happen. You, know, you, have, you have to accept that as, as, as real fact, and how do, you, how do you grieve that? How do you process that? How do you pull it out and work with it? It becomes, becomes kind of key. Um, eventually, we tend to lose our sense of self. Like, who am I? What do I stand for? What, am I, what, what do I belong to? Um, these are, these are pieces that, that people wrestle with quite a bit. I mean, other losses in addiction, I mean, there's plenty of, plenty of stuff out there. You talk about experiences. You know, even though I may be in the room, I am not present if I'm hired on. I'm just not tuned in, not there at all. Tons of relationships are lost, whether they are, in fact, lost through death or people moved away or people won't have anything to do with me or just, I'm just not connected anymore. Parenting time, a lot of our clients have spent some time incarcerated and consequently separated from their kids, or they've got protection orders out against them and they're not allowed to see their kids. And that is very painful for many of them. Uh, they missed all the family milestones, the weddings, the births, the funerals, those kinds of things. Uh, because even if they've been there, they haven't been. Not present mentally, emotionally. They missed the, the expressions of grief that happened in the family. There's this, this whole issue of time sometimes and how we reflect on time. Um, People frequently have a lot of expectations for the future, what could have been, shoulda, woulda, coulda. Could have gone to school, could have been a doctor, could have had grandkids. I mean, those are all the kinds of things that, that, that people really wrestle with sometimes. Ton of, ton of opportunities are lost, jobs, school, that sort of thing. The perinatal losses don't tend to come out as much, 
But a number of, of clients have had miscarriages, and it's just sort of like, well, it's just there. It's just there, you know? And yet, when they come into recovery, it's like, no, it's a loss. And it may even be some time later, but the loss is very real and powerful for them. Um, the spiritual losses, people not knowing who they are, their sense of self, you know, there's just a lot of losses. But in the long run, you know, we talk about grieving being necessary. If you don't grieve, you hardly exist. The type of life we live depends on the work we do through our grieving. I want to make it sound like it's a full-time job, all right? Please, don't, uh, don't, don't be brought down by that. But growth comes from working things through. Good grieving engages us more fully in life. Let me say that again. Good grieving engages us more fully in life. Okay, but th there's a piece that a lot of people, particularly what, what I refer to as earth people, these are non-alcoholics and addicts, don't understand. And that is the losses when moving from active addiction into recovery. You say, what do you mean? They're getting into recovery. This is great. No more ambulance rides. No more court visits. No more. We, it's going to be wonderful. I can't, I can't wait. But what we don't realize is, is that anybody who's undergone a significant life change, and we go back to Janice's wedding, it was a good thing, but she still had some stuff she had to give up. <coughs> anybody whose life goes through a significant change, like getting clean and sober, there is always an element of loss associated with that change. The losses can be quite severe for the addict, the alcoholic. I mean, first and most important of all is the loss of our alcohol and other drugs. Now, some people say, good riddance, I'm glad, but I, I want to I'm, I'm wanna, I wanna work with you a minute on that. The alcoholic or addict, their relationship they have with the drug of choice is primary. Okay? Remember Billy Joel wrote the song about the piano man, talking about the man making love to his tonic and gin? It is a seductive and intimate relationship we have with our drug of choice. You need to understand that. But also go back to the attachments. When I first started drinking and drugging, it was a very secure attachment. Two or three drinks and I knew where I'd be, and things were good. But after a while, not so good. Got a DUI, got in trouble, had a fight, lost a job. Some stuff's starting to happen. It's a little more, a little, little more you know, anxious attachment. Then we start getting near the end, it's like, can't imagine continuing to drink, and I can't imagine not drinking. The, the big book, that's a paraphrase of what it says in the book. We get to the place where we can't, we can't do either. That's, that's, I've gotten to the place of an avoidant attachment. I can't imagine doing without it, and I can't imagine continuing with it. That's a hell of a place to be, is what the book says. But we start to talk about that. Um, it's kind of important that, you, that we understand the importance of that drug. Because what starts to happen is family members, when they're two weeks clean or sober, are just excited, they're exhilarated. Wonderful things are happening. The world's going to be wonderful again. I'm going to have all my dreams back and stuff. And the alcoholic addict is thinking, yeah, but it hurts so damn much. And I got nothing to cover it up with. And I got no tools to deal with it. You really have to understand how much has been lost when people get clean and sober. It's a big piece. If you've got a recovery person in the family, you've got to understand there's a lot lost. Now, and there are constants of this loss in early recovery. It's important that it, it, it gets too often minimized by friends and family. Not that you know, we want to think about it as a good thing. Again, you want to think about the avoidant relationship in relationships between people is usually in a relationship that is mediated by some kind of abuse or neglect. Okay, well, eventually the, the alcohol or the drug has been abusing you in ways it didn't early in the experience. Um, there's also this issue of some of the rituals and the roles that happen while in the culture of addiction. You know, giving up the addictive lifestyle itself can be traumatic. In addition to the loss of the drug of choice, there's, those entering recovery may grieve the places they went, the rituals and distractions associated with use, the people they used and drank with. You know, some people will grieve the loss of the freedom and the lack of responsibility that comes with substance abuse. Under the influence, it's real easy to ignore things that aren't interesting and fun. It really is. And in the culture of addiction, you, you gotta, gotta latch onto this one a minute because it's, it's gonna cause some real challenged feelings for you. But in the culture of addiction, the drug dealer is an important and respected person. Often given deference by lots and lots of people. When they cross over into the culture of recovery, there's a dramatic diminishment of their social capital. These are suddenly, and they're in amongst people who understand who they were and what they've been up to. Stuff is happening here. And again, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to get sober, please. Best thing I ever did. But the bottom line is, you have to understand, these folks are wrestling with stuff that is not automatically apparent. There's stuff that needs to be grieved and talked about. I mean, in the long run, early people, 
begin to realize that they have lost a lot. Lots and lots and lots. You know, uh, Michael Block, the author, makes a point about it. He says, you know, if you're an addict on the road to recovery, be prepared to experience emotions in a new way, both the good and the bad. And be sure to have a plan in place to manage the cravings while you're in that vulnerable state. You know, I, we refer to it as learn to surf the emotional urges. You know, the whole surfing thing. Uh, frequently, people in early recovery think when I have a feeling, this is going to last forever until I do something about it, like drink or drug. You just have to say that's the automatic response. It's been habitually arranged for over many years and chemically reinforced for a very long time. Okay? What they don't understand is whatever feeling you have, no matter how intense or strong, is not going to last forever. It will pass. But believing that early on, they're not, they're not buying it. They think, I'm, they think I'm lying to them. Okay? You just have to understand that, that, that piece of it. I think it's, it's really important. Being consciously aware of how much they lost is incredibly painful. In recovery, there are barriers to grieving that are real specific, too. The grief is complicated by guilt, shame, trauma, or stigma. Um, you know, there's a lack of social support. We talked about the isolation already. A, piece a lot of people are not aware of is being unable to identify, verbalize, or feel feelings. People in early recovery, when I say to them, how do you feel, they usually respond with one of two words. I feel good, I feel bad. Well, tell me what kind of bad. <sighs> and I, I, I will get growls, I will get grunts, okay? I want to, okay, here's a chart. I have ten words here. Pick one that comes, starts to come close. The lack of an emotional vocabulary is incredibly difficult for people early in recovery. <laughs> Because the inability to communicate what's going on for you, to talk to people about it, to put it in clear language, is clearly limiting in terms of my ability to process it emotionally. So the notion, we, we even have word charts. I have, I have an example here. I've, I've seen several different versions of it. But it's like, you know, like pick a word, angry. OK, so I have aggravated, agitated, anguished, annoyed, blustered, burned up, critical, cross, cutting. I mean, it just got down to C. It goes all the way down to S, <laughs> all right? But you know, and, and clients can have fun with this because they start playing with words and they start, oh, well, what, what's that one? I don't even know what that means. You know, I'm not get the dictionary. I, really, you can have a lot of fun with this. But this is more than a game. This is about learning to talk about life. This is learning about to process my losses. This is learning about processing life. And understanding that shortage of a lot of times they say, well, they're not saying much. I don't know what they're thinking. They don't know how to say much. How do I help them say much? How do I put words in their mouth sometimes? You know. Um, that's it's, it's part of what we do. Uh, feelings unfreeze and can be overwhelming. Yeah, the intensity of any emotion can be incredibly strong in early recovery. Uh, people get these seemingly unrelated feelings will just jump out at them. Uh, anger, depression, anxiety. And, and there are not a lot of coping skills. A lot of people just never develop them or let them rust out while they were using. And they, a lot of them do not have a plan for how they're going to handle alcohol or drug craving. A lot of what you're hearing there is sort of the, the, the agenda for what we try to accomplish in, in treatment with clients. How do we give you a good emotional vocabulary? How do we teach you to process the pieces out in front of you? How do we teach you to urge the surface? Surge the, surf the urges. OK, I'll get it out sooner. We'll get there. OK, as we proceed. Now, recovery is a process. I love this picture, by the way. I had to stick it in there someplace. It's a spiral staircase. I'm sure it's a famous place, but I don't know where it is. I've just only seen the picture. You know, grief work like addiction recovery is not a linear process. We're going to bounce around sometimes. Ideally, people in recovery acknowledge, understand, and accept their losses effectively as they move through their grief. There are some specific tasks of recovery that relate to grieving. I mean, one is just the, the whole piece we talked about, learning to work with the feelings and getting the vocabulary back again. You know, developing the skills to cope with those feelings. You know, once you have the words, you've got to use them, talk about them. Uh, learn to tolerate negative feelings. No feeling. However strong, it's going to last forever. Open up, identify, talk about it. Get over the shame, stigma, and guilt a challenge associated with a lot of this. The, it wasn't necessarily the, the direct, um, I don't know for sure, it wasn't exactly the, the intent of Bill Wilson when he was writing the 12 steps, but steps four and five are incredibly good at getting people to sort of process and talk about the stuff they feel shame and guilt about. You know. And if you've ever been through that process and done it thoroughly, you realize you come away feeling better about yourself. Even when you talk about all this stuff that you really don't feel good about. But you've processed it. You've put words to it. You've owned it. You've made it and you've moved on. Um, accept the support from people around you. You don't have to start to develop new attachments. The, the most 
The ability to form new attachments is the best sign that process, grief is being processed effectively. Got to develop some new rituals. You know, we used to, uh, you know, gather at the dumpster and and <coughs> smoke a little dope before we go to work. Uh, now we we oh, pardon me, where to go? Oh, okay, we got to go for coffee. Um, a lot of people need to discover or rediscover things like hobbies, art, music, sports, crafts. It's interesting when you just like throw a few things out, throw a few guitars and, and some crayons and paper out in front of clients sometime and watch what happens. Amazing stuff starts to take place because it's starting to open up a new, a new path. Um, uh, uh, Kevin McCauley, we've had him in the speaker series a couple of times before. He did the two movies, uh, Pleasure Unwoven and Memo to Self. He talked about recovery. One of the things he talked about was he says, we need to have some hedonic rehabilitation, which is all I just need to learn how to have fun again. Okay, because for such a long time I've defined fun as what comes in a bottle or a needle. You know, and I need to find new ways to find fun. And that's part of what we do with clients sometimes. What are you doing? You're having this adventure therapy thing. You're bouncing all around and climbing ropes and yeah, yeah, we're having fun, okay? It may not look like fun, but it's fun. Have fun, please, okay. Um, in recovery, it gives us opportunities. You know, we can fix old relationships, heal damaged ones, we can grieve the lost ones, we can build new ones, but we make meaning uh, of the past by helping others. You know, I, if I can't go back to old relationships, I can write letters, I can do indirect amends. But I can generate a history or a narrative of this process of grieving and recovering. And I can find a place for it in my mind and heart. And I can share it with others. So this whole process of making a narrative of the history and sharing it, in AA we call that an open talk. We stand up and we talk about what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. That's what's happening. I'm processing it. It's not just a matter of I'm telling history now, but I'm actually processing the history as I'm talking to you. Um, uh, recovery office also offers the opportunity to connect or reconnect with one's spiritual self and to grow spiritually, whether that's in a specific faith or set of beliefs or just finding new purpose in life. But after experiencing the sudden loss of her husband, Author of the book Lean In, Sheryl Sandberg observed, she said, you know, I think when tragedy occurs, it presents a choice. You can give into the void, the emptiness that fills your heart and lungs, that constricts your ability to think and even breathe, or you can try to find some meaning. Like, what's the purpose behind all this? What has it freed me up to do that is different? You know, what about the losses and grieving processes for the family and friends of addicts and alcoholics? I mean, it's, it's interesting because the reaction to the loss that is widely experienced by friends and family of persons in addiction is profound grief. And it's really because the loss, the loss is ambiguous. If a person dies, the grief is unambiguous. The social role is, is, is empty. The deceased played that no longer there. And the deceased cannot fulfill the obligations of the promises or their promises. However, the spouse or child or friend who becomes addicted often ceases to fulfill the obligations or promises, but physically the social role is still occupied. It's difficult to grieve the loss of people still around. It's kind of a key piece. Because if you're in recovery, I suspect there's some relationships you had to build a distance into, or perhaps even terminate, because some of those relationships are connected to your use. And you go, okay, yeah, but it was good for a while. And I have to grieve it, you know? I have to leave it. It's part of it. As we start to think about the losses for family and friends can include, obviously, the, the usual sorts of things. The financial security I need to touch on, lots of families have gone into second mortgages to pay for treatments, have had incredible legal fees that they've, they've had to meet. The financial challenges have not been small. Hopes and dreams for the future are, are often dashed. People are thinking about what their kids could have been and what they can't be now that they have a felony conviction. Um, uh, people's self-esteem, they're thinking about like, what kind of person am I that I would have a kid like this? What did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. You just happened to be where you were. You know, what, think about social standing. What are the neighbors thinking? And, and am I the kind of person that would lie for my child or spouse all the time in order to try to cover up for the stuff that I feel shameful about? Um, and they, they miss emotional support, you know, because the stigma tends to isolate us. The whole person has experienced the loss in so many different ways. And they can be complicated losses, incredibly painful, lots of memories associated with that. Um, I, the feelings are complex because I can both love and resent the person at the same time. There's usually very little honest conversation about feelings because to be honest would be too darn painful. And so I stop talking about it. 
The loss of contact by choice, where we make decisions to cut relatives off or to not see them because it's the only healthy thing for us to do. It's a self-protective thing for us to do. But it is, in fact, a loss of significant size. What about the enforced separation because somebody's been incarcerated? Um, or, the, or after a death, the terrible sense of unfinished business with the deceased. And how do I start to work with that? As, uh, as we navigate the changes, we experience this sense of loss that come about from those changes. We move from continuums, and there's, there's various continuums. It just shows you the kind of places. It's likely that in addiction and late in addiction that, that you're going to see the kinds of things listed on the left side of the, 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 the chart rather prevalently, and you're moving in the direction of the other side. One of the ones that, that most people feel very strongly about is the ambiguity. Notice, I never knew what was coming next. It was nothing I could depend on. It just was there. Rather, I get into the place of, I can count on it. If we set a date, somebody's going to show up. I know that. It starts to change. But you start to see that. Um, but there's a movement along a continuum from chaos after the change or loss to a new normal. Letting go of what was and accepting what is being coming into being, eventually we have less chaos and more predictability. We start moving from anxious and avoidant attachments to more secure attachments. The attachments can change over time. Uh, how do you give support? Well, don't grieve alone. Experience your feelings. Express your feelings. Uh, turn to family and friends. AA, NA, Al-Anon, those are all places you can get a lot of support. Uh, name and process the feelings. Express your feelings in a tangible and creative way. Uh, I had a sister who passed of uh, breast cancer two years ago. And after she passed, my brother-in-law made these little wooden boxes and he had a stained glass top in the box. And when you open the box, inside were like reduced copies of some of my sister's artwork and her writings. And that sits on the shelf in my TV room, in the bookshelf. And so I walk by it two or three times a day, and I have this fond memory of my sister because the goodness is... Now, that first year, I didn't feel so good about the box, okay? But I wasn't... I, I'm still processing. I'm still weaving the tapestry, okay? But, but it's, it's part of the piece that's going on. Um, it's important to look after your health, too. Physical health, a lot of us, it's like we don't eat or sleep right, that sort of thing. You want to get social support or help from the community? The best therapy for grief is time and community. I mean, look at the 12-step work. 12-step work helps people express grief, gain ex perspective and acceptance, forgive and move forward in their lives. Um, I'm getting short on time. I've got, what, about three minutes left? I do. Okay, social support. There we go. What are the types of support from family, friends, and others? Um, spiritual support. You can engage or re-engage in the spiritual practices or rituals of the faith you belong to. They're often faith-based support or prayer groups. The uh, back of the handout packet really has a lot of good references. Some online references to some groups, references to some uh, counseling services that might be available to you, might be helpful. Uh, but the genetic, generic approaches of prayer and meditation that the people in recovery are invited to by the 11th step can be a great aid in processing feelings. There's the whole ritual thing, like what are some things I can do which are going to help me process this in the long run. I remember with great um, appreciation uh, when I was in college, uh, one of the people who lived in the dorm I lived in, his father had passed a couple of years before that. And one day he said, can you all come over to my house Sunday night for my father's meal? I said, what do you mean? Well, this is what he did once a year on the anniversary of his father's death. His mother would cook up a big deal and he'd invite all his friends over and they'd tell stories about his dad. It was a great ritual. It was a great piece. It was a great way to remember, a great way to process the unfinished pieces. Because every year it got less and less sad and more and more remembering the good pieces. Um, yeah, and I'm about on time there. I mean, I want to remember the self-care thing. That's all about eat, sleep, do what you need to do. The one piece I want to make sure we get to though is when grief is healed. You know, when a person can think of what is lost without acute pain, that's why I'm with my sister today. I don't have any acute pain anymore. Uh, when one can think of what was lost without physical manifestations such as crying or feeling tightness in the chest. I mean, I may have a tear now and then, but, but I'm just not overly physically challenged by it. When one can reinvest their emotions in life and living, make new attachments, that's the big piece. And one can regage an interest in life, feel more hopeful, Experience healthy gratification again and adapt to new roles. Uh, and is, how long does it last? 
one year, uh, four seasons, two years. It really depends on, on where you are and, and what you're going to do. Um, there's some other things in there, but the, but the handouts, I think, are pretty thorough on that. So at this time, I wanna, I'm going to turn it over to Barb. What I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. Um, I grew up in an alcoholic home. My father was the alcoholic, and uh, he was a violent alcoholic. And he drank every single day of my childhood except for two weeks when he was in the hospital for double pneumonia. But when he came home from the hospital, he resumed his drinking. So that pretty much was my childhood. He would drink, my mother would scream and yell. Um, there was, we were short on money. Um, there was just a lot of chaos. And I started drinking as a teenager, and so then I became a problem for my mother. And so she was constantly on my case. So I decided at 17 that I was going to leave home because I figured I was taking care of myself anyways. Nobody was taking care of me. I can do it. I can do it better by myself out of this crazy house. And that really wasn't a very good decision, but at the time I thought it was. And I, uh, I was working. I had been working since I was young, very young, and I had no problems working and I was working hard. Sometimes I had to work three jobs to take care of everything that needed to be taken care of. And then um, I got pregnant, and I had my son, Brent. And my mother begged me to come home. I was 19. She begged me to come home so she could help me take care of him. And at the time, I was living with two other girls, and we weren't getting along. So it was a pretty good, um, it was enticing to go home so she could help me. And I did, and I stayed, stayed there for a year until my son was a year old. And, but my dad was still drinking and it was still crazy, and so I just had to leave. And it was soon after that that my mother got into al -Anon. Her doctor, she had a lot of heart issues, so her heart doctor told her that, you know, this stress is killing you. You've got to do something and introduced her to al -Anon which is for the family and friends of, of the alcoholic or drug addict. And so she went for about two years until she decided that she had had enough of my dad's drinking. Um, no one was in the house. I have an older sister, younger brother. Everyone had moved, so it was just my mother and my father. And at that time, they'd been married for 25 years. And my mother left a note on the table for him that said, I have left, didn't tell him where she went, and said that she would not come back unless he got into treatment. So he uh, called my sister, who is the nurse and the fixer of the family, and she came over and she told him, you have a choice here. You can either get into, go to treatment, get into recovery, stop your drinking, and possibly continue with your marriage, or continue drinking, and your marriage is over. And he really made a wise decision. He went into here in Oaks at the time, and it was a 28-day program here at St. Joan. And they had a family night. And so my mother instructed, <laughs> me and my sister and my brother, that we needed to be there for that family night to support my dad. So we did. We went. But it was so confusing to me. Uh, my whole life, everybody was telling me that he wasn't an alcoholic. Everything that I saw that went, happened really didn't happen. And my perception was always off because I was like, well, maybe I didn't really see that. And so now you're telling me he is an alcoholic? I'm just totally confused. Totally confused. So I decided that night that this was their problem. At that time, I'm a single mom. I have a three-year-old son. I thought, this is not my problem. This is your problem. And I just went on about my life. 
got married, had a daughter, and when my daughter was a year old, my mother, she was just a, a she was just a tiny thing, but she was a pit bull. <laughs> and she decided that I needed to go to an Al Anon meeting. And so she told me about it. And I said, Well, when is it? She said, It's Monday night, 8 o'clock, in Milan at, at the Catholic Church. And she said, And it's an hour. I said, Oh, well, I can't possibly go. Eight o'clock is when I put my daughter to bed. And she said, well, how about if you have your, her dad put her to bed? Or maybe you can put her to bed at seven o'clock? So I knew, I just knew that uh, I had to go. So I just thought, I'm just going to go one to one meeting and get her off my back. And so I went to this meeting, and they had two tables. One table was for the new person, and it was me and another gal. And there were a few other people at the table also. And then there was another table that was full. And me and this other gal were crying. And, you know, it, it was traumatic. At this other table, they're laughing, having a good time. I'm like, I need to be over here at this other table. I need to be at this happy table here. But I say that that was the start of my journey of really living life. Because what I found there is I found support. I found people. In the beginning, I was a little suspicious. Everybody was so nice and caring and gave me hugs and was smiled when I came in. Oh, we're so glad to see you. Keep coming back. And I thought, oh, there's got to be a catch here or something. There's something that they want me to do for them. Never in my life had something been unconditional like this. And so that was the hook for me, and that's why I kept coming back. Because, and also, it made me feel better. I was learning some skills. I was learning how to stand up for myself. I was in an abusive marriage, and then I started to say, no, you can't treat me like this anymore. And my life changed. It really changed for the better. And then my son, Brent, he, when he was 13, he started using, and I did not know that he was using. His father and I were um, going through a divorce, and that was traumatic. And so I'm trying to deal with this and trying to be a single mom again with two kids. And he, I got a phone call from the school that he had bought pot off of somebody at school. And he was in middle school at the time. And I thought, oh my gosh. So I go to the school. And they said, you know, we realize that, that it's a hard time in your family. You know, you guys are going through this divorce. This is the first time he's ever been in trouble. We're just going to brush it to the side. And that's what they did. And so I tried to get him help. I realized that there was a problem. I would take him to counselors, and he would sit there. He wouldn't speak. He would not speak. So the counselor would say, there's nothing I can do. I can't, I'm wasting my time. I'm not going to waste my time on somebody that doesn't want any help. There was this one group through the U of M, and it was um, at risk for at-risk children his age. And so I took him to that, and it was, there was probably like 25 kids. And uh, then there was a, uh, I had to go to the, to the parent session while he was in the session with the, for the young people. And after the session, the uh, leader of my son's session took me aside and, and said, we cannot help your son. We, ha we are, are, are doing well. Everyone gets along in this group, and your son will not participate. We cannot have him come anymore. And so I just threw my hands up. What, what am I to do? What am I to do with this kid? And I was still going to Al-Anon, and it was so helpful. Because then I was hearing from other parents that had children that, that, were ha that had addiction problems. So that was so helpful. I wasn't alone. I didn't have to do this with my son alone. And then I was, I was at work one day. And he was supposed to be in school. And the Sumter Township Police Department called me. They had my son. They had arrested him. He had 
purchased a stolen gun, and he had discharged it. So they were charging him, and they were going to wait to charge him until after they decided whether the gun had been involved in any crimes. Because it was stolen, who knows what had happened. So they were, and it took two weeks. Now today, it probably wouldn't take that long, but it took two weeks until we found out the gun was just stolen, it was clean, it wasn't used in any other, um, you know, who knows, he would have been charged with whatever had happened with that gun. And that really, really scared me, and it scared him. And we, so then what happened was, though, is that it was no longer mom on Brent's case. Now you've got the court system on his case. And they realized that he had a substance abuse problem because he had to go through a lot of testing that was part of um, the court case. And the judge was wonderful. She told my son at sentencing that as long as he went into treatment, because they realized he had a substance abuse problem, as long as he went into treatment, didn't use, did what he was supposed to do, he could live with me at my house. Now, they told me that if he lived with me, they would be snapping by and checking. And if there were any drugs or alcohol in the home, regardless of whether it was his drugs and alcohol or not, he was gone for a minimum of nine months to a detention facility. And it would have been in Detroit because we, at the time we were living in Wayne County. So that scared me. After I got that information, I quit drinking. I quit drinking, and I say I quit drinking for my son because it is true. I did quit drinking for him, but I stay sober for me. And today I celebrate 21 years of sobriety. Oh. And it's a wonderful life. The life I have um, in recovery is absolutely wonderful. And no matter what happens in my life, I do not have to use. I do not have to. But I can't do it alone. I have to have my support system. I have AA and I have al -Anon. And I work both programs very, very hard because I know what the consequences are if I don't. And I don't want to give up everything that I have gained. Now my son, unfortunately, after, well, he was clean for a year and a half after, the, after he got into trouble because um, he was able to embrace recovery for a year and a half because he, he learned some tools. He went to Growth Works in Plymouth, and it was very intensive. He had to go three days a week, plus he had to go to five, eight, 80 meetings a week. And at the time, we weren't, he wasn't driving, so it was my husband and I and my father that was running him to all these things. Now, it's wonderful, but what is sad, too, is that the other two children in our home, they, they suffered because we had to put so much attention on Brent and his recovery. So, you know, I have some guilt about that, that, that my two other children, you know, didn't have the time with me that they could have had. But Brent, at that time, was our top priority. We were going to give him the support he needed to get through this. And I actually um, really got encouraged. I thought, wow, he was doing so good. He was going to school and getting good grades, and he was praying at the flagpole in the morning before school started. He was dating a cheerleader. He was working. He, I let him get his driver's license because he had been doing so well. You know, he got a car. I mean, just things were just going along. And I was like, oh, here we go. You know, now I can have the rest of my life with my son in a healthy way rather than screaming and yelling and crying and, and everything that goes into having somebody that actively uses. And then he got off of probation. Turned 18, graduated from high school. And he decided that he was going to go to Green Bay, Wisconsin to go to college because um, he had met a girl that lived in Wisconsin. She was going to school at Eastern, but she was going to transfer back to Wisconsin where her family was. So he left. 
And that was very sad. That was such a sad day when he left. Um, we drove him, actually, to Wisconsin. And then my, it was my daughter, my husband, and I. And on the way back, I would cry for a little while, and my daughter would hold me, and then she would cry for a little while, and I would hold her. It was so sad that we, but it was also, I was also hopeful. He went, he started college. He was showing me some of the stuff when we got together, how well he was doing academically. I mean, things were really progressing, so I thought, wow, okay. He's on his way. And then he started using again. And it was nothing but a nightmare. It got bad very quickly. And he would get fired from jobs. His girlfriend was always complaining, which she had every right to. You know, everything fell on her. Until finally, she got sick of it, and she left. So then, he doesn't have a job, so he can't keep his apartment. Decides he's going to go to um, California. He'd always wanted to go to, he's a musician, always wanted to go to California, live on the beach, play his, you know, music and live that kind of life. So I didn't think it was a good idea, but he went. So he gets to L.A., tries to buy drugs, and he just gets jacked for his money. He gives me a call. I need some money to get back to, to Wisconsin. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, you know, it's, it's just like I stopped answering the phone because every time I answered the phone, it was a problem. And it wasn't a little problem. The problems were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So we wired him some money, got him back, tried to talk him into coming to Michigan so we could help him. Wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. So then I get a phone call. I had just gotten off work, just gotten home, was trying to make some dinner. I got a phone call from a hospital in Wisconsin. My son had tried suicide. And the social worker was so sweet. And she said, this was a very serious attempt. Um, can you guys get here? And it's a nine hour drive. I, I thought, well, let's just drive it. And then my husband's like, no, let's see if we can get a flight. It'll probably be faster. It's only like an hour flight. So we got a flight out, went to, went to Wisconsin, and they had put him in a mental facility. And when we got there, they let me see him, and it didn't even look like him. I couldn't even believe how bad he looked. He was so thin. He hadn't been eating. He was thin anyways. He was like a skeleton, and he had his wrists were wrapped because he had slit his wrists. And we went into this family counseling area. It was my husband and I, this counselor, and my son. And the counselor was just talking to us about addiction and, and suicide, and, and he really had my son pegged. He said, you know, He's brilliant. He's very smart. So the average thing just doesn't appeal to him. He gets bored easy. And so this, this drinking and drugging and that lifestyle is exciting to him. So that he, the, the counselor was telling us that it was a, a lot, there was a lot more to it than I thought there was. You know, I just thought, hey, you know what? Not? I quit drinking. Oh, why can't you quit drinking? You know, why can't you get it together? I got it together. But this counselor was really good, and he told my son, he said, I want you to try to not use for six months. Just give us six months. Don't use, go to meetings, move back in with your parents, you know, do whatever you need. So they allowed us to take him. But we had to stay with him for 72 hours, so we did. The only thing that he heard from this counselor is that the counselor said in six months it's okay for him to use. That's all he heard. I was like, man, 
we've got, this is one problem that I can't fix. You know when they're little and they scrape their knee and you pick them up and you wash their knee off and you give them a kiss and everything's fine. This wasn't one of those times. This was one of those times where I knew that we were headed into disaster. So we talked to him, we begged him, we asked him, please come home with us. And he said, no, he said, no, nope, I'm not, I'm not doing it, I'm not, not coming home. So we had to leave. So we were on our way to the airport and he was driving and he decided to t make a left-hand turn. He goes over an embankment and over into a gas station. And I'm like, oh my gosh. If I don't know what powerless is at that moment, here, he just got out of a mental institution and he's driving like a crazy person to the gas station. And I'm just like, wow, I don't know what to do. I really don't know what to do. I would pray, I prayed constantly. Finally, it, just, it was just one problem after the other. He ended up losing his apartment. He's living in his car in Wisconsin. We, there's nothing we can do. We're not sending any money. And my mother, my father, my husband and I, we sat down and we decided that we were going to try to do an intervention. So we called Brent on the phone. We asked him to come home and let us help him. Because at that time, he was living in his car. And I figured, you know, I just don't know if he has the resources to get out of that car. I just, I just didn't see it happening. And also, my mother consulted an addiction specialist. And they said, yes, yes, by all means, bring him home, but have a very strict contract, which we did. We, I wrote it up. I said, OK, you have to, do, you have to uh, get a job. You can't use at the house. You have to go to AA. You have to go to church, all these things. And some of the things he did, he did do. And for about three months, he lived with us, and he did pretty well. It was manageable. And then he started drugging. And he's going to Detroit to buy drugs, and he's getting arrested, and he's shoplifting, and he got into a car accident, and he hurt, it, hurt someone. I mean, it just was just like one thing after that. I was like, oh my gosh, this is not working. So Thanksgiving was coming up, and I thought, I'm going to hang on because he hadn't been home in four years because he was living in Wisconsin. I thought, I'm going to, let's just get through Thanksgiving so all the family can see him. Then I was going to have a sit down with him and see if I couldn't force my hand at getting him into some type of a recovery. So after Thanksgiving, it was the Saturday night, and I sat him down and I said, Brent, this is not working. At the time, his uh, younger brother was 13. And I knew, I've sat around enough meetings that I know that sometimes an older sibling can get a younger sibling to start using, and I was not going to have it. I felt like I, it had been five months. I felt like I had given Brent as much leeway as I could. I was no longer helping him. I was just enabling him to use. He just had a roof over his head and no bills, so he could use with any money that he made, and that's what he did. So I sat him down, and I said, Brent, you need to go into treatment. You have a problem. This is, this is not working. And he said, no, I don't have a problem. You're the one that has a problem. I like drinking and I like drugging and I'm not going to stop. And I said, even if it kills you? And he thought about it for a second and he said, I am not afraid to die. So I said, all right, you have to leave. And at that time, I was doing his laundry. So I went downstairs, and I got a laundry basket, and I folded all his clean clothes that I had washed and dried. And I gave him a little bit of money, gave him his laundry. And I asked him one more time as he was at the door. I said, please, Brent, please go into treatment. 
please, you want to be in California? I said, I will mortgage my house. I will fly you to California. And he said, no, Mom, no. I'm not going to go. He said, if you take me there, I will just walk. So I kissed him and I hugged him and I told him goodbye. And that was the last time I saw him alive. Exactly one week, he was dead. And I got that phone call. We were at a church function. My parents and I, um, some family friends, my husband and I, and um, my son's girlfriend was blowing up all our phones. And um, once we got into, into the car, then we were able to talk to her. And she talked to my husband, and we were driving. And I heard, and he said, my husband said, oh, no. And I knew, I knew, just by the tone of his voice. So I said, is he dead? And my husband wouldn't say anything. I said, is he dead? And my husband said, yes. And I just lost it, lost it. I was screaming and yelling, and I said, stop this car. I need to get out of this car. I can't breathe. He's like, no, no, we got to get home. we got to get home. And it was just a nightmare. And you know, I knew that it was going to be bad. I knew that whole week was going to be bad. And I wanted to drink. I said, oh man, I can't do this sober. There is no way. But there was no alcohol in the home and nobody would let me drive. Nobody would let me out of their sight. And you know that that urge passed. So anybody here that's trying to stay sober, it will pass. You just can't give into it. Thankfully, my house was set up so there was nothing I could do. And I'm so grateful that I didn't have to use. I'm so grateful that I am still sober today, regardless of what I have been through. Now, what I have done, I've, I took a year where I didn't ha basically did nothing. I worked, I went to one meeting a week, I went to church, and that was it. My husband, who is my awesome soulmate, did everything. He cooked, he would bring food to my bedroom. For one year, I did nothing. I was just a mess. And I feel bad about that because I had a, my youngest was at home and he didn't have me for a year. But then after a year, I thought, you know what? I can't do this anymore. And I had joined an online group of women. It was moms that had lost their children to addiction. And a couple of those women had wrote books. And these women were just a great resource to me because a lot of them were further along in this process than I was. And so I decided, you know what? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to choose activism. I am going to make sure that my son's death is not in vain. And so that's what I did. I wrote a book and it's called Brent's World. And it's the story of my son's life from my perspective. And what it has done is it has opened doors. I've gone to schools, churches, any place that'll have me. And I, there's a presentation that I do, depending on how long I have. We've got uh, videos and slides, and my husband comes with me. I think the, the one that probably made the most impact on me is I, I did a presentation over at um, the juvenile detention center over here on Hogback. And they had us in a room. And these kids were all incarcerated. And they were, they were teenagers. And they were all males. And we were in this room. And all they could do, they had nothing. There's, there was no phones that they're on, nothing. They had, to sit, they had to listen to what I had to say. And so I start out my talk by talking about my son's life and different things that he liked. I show pictures when he was a baby, when he was little. So it kind of catches their attention. And then I start in and talking to him about addiction. And then when I tell him that, that he died, every single one of them, their head went down like that. They're pretty tough kids. 
and they weren't wanting to cry. But you know, I got a lot of hugs from those boys before we left. That is what is helping me get through this. Because if I can reach someone else's kid, and maybe that they'll hear me, that it's not this glamorous, wonderful lifestyle, that there's another side to it. There's a family that loves you and that's hurting when you're using. You know, if I could just save one kid, I would feel like my son's life would not be in vain. I, you know, life has gone on. There's nothing I can do. Brent is gone. I have his memory, and it has gotten easier, and we do celebrate his life. And now I have a grandson that's never going to know his uncle, but we talk to him all the time about his uncle. He knows his, we call him Uncle Brenny. He knows about Uncle Brenny. And that makes me feel good. It makes me feel good that I'm alive, I'm sober, I'm trying to make a difference in other people's lives, and, and hopefully I can help my grandson. I can help my grandson. If there's ever an issue, I want to be there for him. I really want to be there for him. Today, I have a lot of hope. There's a lot of hope. I sit around a lot of meetings. I go to a lot of meetings. And I see a lot of people come in broken and distraught and just don't know how they're going to go on. And after they get moving along in recovery, they start smiling, they start laughing, they get jobs, they get their families back. That is, that is salve to my wounds. It really is to see other people just be able to just take off. So if you're here tonight and you're in this journey, don't give up. Don't give up until the miracle happens. There's promises. Don't give up until you start seeing the promises. This is an amazing journey. Is it easy? No. Is it worth it? Yes. Now, I have um, 10 books that I brought. If you, and my books are geared towards young people. It's an easy read. There's some pictures. Um, if you have a young person in your life that you would like them to, to see, to read about um, what it's really like, what really happens, um, my husband will have these books, and I, I'm just giving them away tonight. I do sell them, though, and all the proceeds go, go to Dawn Farm. And I'm so grateful because Dawn Farm was there for me, and Dawn Farm tried to be there for my son, but my son just didn't want the help. But you know what? I do. I do want the help. I do want to stay sober. I do want a wonderful life today, and I really hope that all of you choose that, too. So thank you.